the SM57 on today's Mic Locker. Hey, today we're going to be looking at the Shure SM57. Just about anyone that's been involved in performing, recording, or producing music has either owned, used, or at least heard of the Shure SM57. The capsule in the mic can be traced all the way back to the late 1930s when Ben Bauer, a Ukrainian refugee, designed the first single element directional microphone for the Shure Brothers company, dubbed the Unidyne. In 1959, after a period of three years of further developing and testing the Unidyne, Ernie Seeler unveiled the SM series of mic capsules for Shure, which we know today. Initial intentions were for the Shure SM series to be used for classical recordings, as Ernie had a bit of a disdain for rock music. Funny how that turned out. Since 1965, the SM57 and SM58 are probably the most used mic in all of rock and roll. Its price point, which has been about $100 for as long as I can remember, put it in reach of just about anyone from beginner to pro. From vocals to drums to guitar and a whole array of other applications, as we saw in the intro, the SM57 is still an industry staple today as it's been for the past half century. The SM57, or 57 as it's known, is a dynamic microphone, so phantom power is not required for the mic to work. It has a cardioid polar pattern, which means the mic primarily picks up what's in front of it and tends to reject sound off to the sides and behind it. The mic has a tiny transformer situated in the body, which connects the capsule to the XLR connector on the rear of the mic. The transformer also protects the capsule from any phantom power that might be accidentally or unavoidably sent to it. It is impedance balance, which helps reduce electrical noise and interference when connected to a balanced mic pre. Since the mic is so widely known, making a video of the stock product would be kind of stale. So to make things a little more interesting, let's take a look at some variations on the mic itself. While the mic is extremely rugged, contrary to popular belief, the mics can and do break. While Shure offers a repair service, which is superb from my experience, the cost of getting a 57 repaired is almost not worth it. At the time of this recording, the rate for a repair for an SM57 through Shure's US flat rate service pricing is $61. Depending on where you are, add in tax and shipping, and you're essentially looking at the same price as a new 57. There are a ton of aftermarket replacement capsules out there from questionable origins for very cheap. A quick eBay search results in some offers under $7 per capsule. $7. While most non-original single replacements run anywhere from $8 to $20, many of the replacements have plastic housings and aren't very heavy. A few feature metal lower chassis, but the capsule area itself is still made out of plastic. The fit is usually very snug as well and needs a little coaxing to get set in place. This is a real Shure SM57 capsule assembly. It's all heavy machine metal. So what does it sound like when you install one of these cheaper capsules? Well, it's not as bad as you might think. Later on, we're going to look at the differences in sound quality between the original, a bootleg, a repaired mic, and a modded 57. So, given a replacement part for the mic goes for so cheap, it's no wonder there are knockoffs of the mic. Companies like Pile, Stag, Monoprice, and more have ridiculously similar looking products with a price point that's sometimes a quarter of the price of the original. For this video, I won't be going into the other commercially available clones, and I use that term lightly as they are not the same mic beyond appearance. There are black market or bootleg SM57s out there that come with a Shure box, paperwork that obviously isn't legit, and even Shure branded cable wraps. These tend to go for too good to be true prices, and that's usually for a reason. The mic is also subject of a few mic mods that are available, usually just changing out the transformer for a different one or removing the transformer altogether. We have a modded 57 we use here in the studio where we removed the transformer and wired the capsule directly to the XLR connector. This changes the output level quite a bit, lower than SM7B territory, as well as the frequency and dynamic response to a degree. But it also makes the mic more susceptible to getting damaged from phantom power. Placing an inline preamp like a cloud lifter will help with the lower output if your mic pre's aren't very clean at higher gain levels, and it'll also ensure that you don't accidentally zap the capsule with 48 volts and blow the diaphragm off the end of the mic. Ask me how I know. 
Some people claim that the transformerless version of the SM57 has a very similar sound to the SM7B. I'm going to address that in this video and look at the similarities between the two. First up, we're going to place the five mics equidistantly around a snare drum. We're going to gain match and then we'll listen back and see what each one sounds like. The files will be made available in a link in the description. Feel free to download and listen to them on your own setup and see what you think about the differences and similarities. We'll have an OMF and a PTX file for you. Next, we're going to put the mics on a guitar cabinet. First a clean guitar part and then some with some heavy distortion. The amps will be playing a reamp performance for consistency's sake. And we'll listen to the mic at the cap and cone junction. Again, we'll listen back and see what's going on with these. Let's get to it. Thank you. 
Okay, so I just wanted to take a closer look at what's going on with the different mics. Uh, this is the snare drum track here, and if we zoom in, we can see the waveform a little bit more closely. Right away, we notice that the phase is completely 180 degrees out for the transformerless version. That's because transformers do flip the phase on the signal going through it. The other thing that we notice is that the bootleg and the capsule replacement have a very jagged waveform. And we can actually hear this in the examples given where the bottom end isn't quite as smooth, but the top end seems to be a little brighter and a little more brittle. Now, while people say that the transformerless mod and the 7B sound similar, while the waveforms on the snare drum track here do look similar, we can clearly hear that the uh, two mics do not sound anything alike um, when listening to the clean and the distorted guitar tracks. To me, the 7B has a little bit more body and the transformerless has a little more bite. Okay, so let me know what you think in the comments. Please hit like and subscribe so we can continue to bring you more videos in the future. In our next video, we're going to be doing a mic giveaway for the mic that we're reviewing, so ring that bell so you know when that video drops. That's it for me for today. Pags, signing off.